So, how was your first day of B-Sides? Awesome. Yeah. All right, now that you're all excited, I'm going to like totally bring it down because <laughs> this is super depressive. Um, <laughs> so, uh, first off, I want to thank the B-Sides organizers for inviting me here. Um, uh, I'm from Ohio, uh, as you can tell by my, uh, I think, of lack of accent, right? All you are the ones with the accent. Um, and I already want to move here, so maybe eventually, but um, it's been great so far. So uh, I want to start out this presentation uh, with a little story. So about 70 years ago, seven years ago, not 70, um, I was married with two kids at the time. Now I have three. Uh, I lived in a super shitty house in the middle of nowhere. Uh, I still live in the middle of nowhere, just in a slightly better house. Um, my second son was about one year old. My, one, uh, my oldest was seven. Our roof leaked. Um, without going into too many details of my marriage, uh, I didn't really have any control over anything that happened in my life. Um, uh, that being said, I remember one night when I kind of realized something was wrong with me. Uh, I was you know, in the shower getting ready for bed. And like throughout the day, I just had become like progressively sadder and sadder until you know, I get out of the shower and I'm, and I'm getting ready and I just like broke down sobbing on the floor and I didn't know what was wrong and the best uh, explanation I can give to anybody is that's exactly how I felt. Um, the inside of my brain was just like scrambled. I couldn't um, actually speak about anything that was going on in my mind. Like it just felt like static. Like there was absolutely nothing I could do about it. Um, you know, my husband at the time came up to me. He thought something super serious was happening. You know, like I wanted a divorce or, you know, I was dying or something like that. Um, and anybody that knows me knows I hate to use the word triggered, but uh, the, the thing that I can, well, the thing that triggered me at the time was that my shower curtain was dirty. Stupidest thing in the world, right? I felt stupid and immature and just like, uh, that doesn't make, any sense at all. Um, so looking back at a lot of it now, uh, a lot of the anxiety problems that I had uh, was because lack of cleanliness, um, which falls under OCD and anxiety and a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, and that itself uh, is a whole other book of stories. So the funny thing is, even when I realized something was wrong, I didn't ask for help. I didn't ask you know, my family, I didn't ask anybody. Um, I figured, at, you know, at like 25, I had made it through so much of my life already and had all of this handled, and I could just do it all myself because I was, you know, that, uh, that much of a veteran of life that I could figure all this out. Um, so why in the world am I bringing this up at an InfoSec con? Uh, first, I consider this community to be um, my family, more of a family than, you know, a majority of my blood relatives. Um, you're the first group of people that, you know, understands, you know, each other and understands some of the stuff I was going through and the stuff that I work on day to day that I could actually talk to about a lot of the stuff that's happening in my life. Um, when I began tweeting and posting on Facebook and talking to people about this kind of stuff, I realized uh, how systemic of a problem that we seem to have and we're just not, uh, you know, verbalizing it. Um, a lot of people are struggling it and struggling with it and trying to tackle it alone like I had been for like 10 or so years that I had realized. Um, a lot of the conversations that I had were with some amazingly happy people. Always joking, always the center of attention, um, you know, just super, super funny, super happy people all the time. And a lot of times those were the people suffering the most because it's a lot easier to put on that kind of facade in front of everybody than actually have to talk about this kind of stuff. Um, so we never want to admit uh, there's anything wrong with us, right? Um, so what's the first part of any like 12 step program? Anybody know? <laughs> yeah, admitting you have a problem and accepting it. Um, but you can't just do that and stop there. You have to actually do something about it. Um, otherwise, you're just going to get more and more depressed that you know something's wrong and you're just not doing anything. Uh, not, in, not only do the people in our industry have the normal stresses of like 
family and money and that kind of stuff. Um, a lot of us are just extremely passionate about what we do. You know, none of you are here because you have to be. If you are, that I'm sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll get through it. Don't worry. Um, and it's our community. I think is different, uh, difficult to compare to any other community. We are passionate and driven, and um, we put ourselves, you know, into our research, and we sit behind computer screens for hours and hours on end, and we do this because, you know, we're, we're trying to cater to our um, willingness to, you know, to do that and not have to be around people. Um, and on top of that, a lot of times you can add on things like incident response or um, helping law enforcement agencies track down child predators, um, a lot of kind of stuff that normal, everyday uh, people don't have to deal with adds all of those stresses on, uh, on top of what you already have. Uh, so first, I want to talk about some of the research that I've done. Um, I read way too many medical journals. <laughs> uh, props to those people for being able to write about all that kind of stuff. Um, there's a lot of information out there. So the first thing that I did is I went to Google and I searched for uh, mental health issues in STEM fields. And I got back about six million results, uh, most of them about women. Now, how much, how, mu how much percent of STEM is women? Like, maybe 10 at this point? So why are four million of the six million, you know, focused around women? I took out that term, it dropped down to like two million results. Um, but it, when, when it comes to mental illness, Sexes are definitely different. Women are most li more likely to be diagnosed with anxiety and depression, and men um, tend to have things like substance, uh, substance abuse, antisocial disorders, that kind of stuff. Uh, but nobody wants to talk about men, uh, even though you make up over 70% of our industry. So the hypothesis that I was trying to prove is that people in STEM might have a higher rate of mental health issues. And turns out there's a couple studies that uh, reinforce that thought that I had. Um, the first is called the Savannah IQ hypothesis. Um, and I'll read a quote from, one, from that because I can't have it memorized. Um, the finding of an association between progressively increasing risk of bipolar disorder and high arithmetic intelligence performance is rather surprising. Not only um, mathematical skill, but the rapid information processing for the purpose of successfully completing a timed exam. High scorers with such rapid processing power may also share a tendency to experience mania, uh, a state of high focus and psychomotor activity, as well as other mental health issues. Um, it also talks about people with higher intelligence uh, tending to self-medicate. <laughs> Um, with alcohol and drugs more than the average person. Um, uh, show of hands, who has watched either all of Mr. Robot or, uh, I mean, at least know, you know, the premise, right? Okay. So they had to have done some research into that, or maybe they just guessed right based on, you know, all of us. Um, but so the main character, Elliot, suffers from social anxiety disorder, uh, depression, delusions, paranoia and he self-medicates himself with morphine and uses Suboxone to come down off of like withdrawal. I don't recommend that. <laughs> no matter what you have, not, not a good idea. But it kind of reinforces, you know, what that paper was about. Uh, so let's move on to some more s st uh, statistics. Uh, not only the Savannah <laughs> IQ interaction hypothesis, uh, talks about the smarts to depression correlation. Um, there was a study done recently at Berkeley that found that between 42 and 48% of those Berkeley students um, in science and engineering uh, are depressed. That's compared to 7% of the overall population. So that makes sense on the Google results. Um, there were significantly more results in involving women because one, I think we report it more, right? Um, and two, people like to focus on minorities. We know that. Um, 
I don't want to try and focus on the men, but now you're the minority. <laughs> so it's not like you guys aren't having issues, believe me, I know some of you. Um, you're just not reporting them. Now I know these say US, just ignore that part. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to prove a point. So all of this, and we still think everybody else has their shit together better than we do. Um, you know, that there are imposter syndrome talks. I mean, there's, there's all this kind of stuff. I know I'm guilty of it constantly. Um, and a lot of people have done research on imposter syndrome, just like we had earlier. Um, and that can go hand in hand a good amount with mental health. So uh, for any of you that don't know, imposter syndrome is a feeling that you shouldn't really be doing what you're doing, either because you don't have enough time put in or you don't have the experience necessary or you're just not smart enough. Um, so a lot of times we see, uh, that's how we see ourselves when we have thoughts of suicide and anxiety. You feel like you're drowning while everybody else is just doing fine. Um, and obviously that's not true. Um, I can think of a good amount of people that have talked me through these kinds of situations as well as all of the times that I've been limited because my brain kind of just decided to go in some crazy direction. Um, you know, I, maybe I didn't apply for that job or I didn't go talk to that person and I'm, you know, shutting myself in because all of that shit's going on inside my head. So, uh, I did find one thing that said the um, U.S. Preventative Services Task Force recommends that all adults be screened for depression. That's all of us. Now, when I read that, I thought, all right, so is that just U.S. citizens? Is that everybody? Is it just, be I mean, like first world problems, right? Um, is it our diet? Is it probably our government? Um, <laughs> Uh, but in the grand scheme of things, we don't really have things that bad, right? You know, we have roofs over our heads in the mo you know, for the most part, food, you know, access to high speed, whatever. Um, but that doesn't really matter when your brain is like eating yourself from the inside out and, you know, you're huddled in a corner or in bed not being able to get out. You know, none of that matters that it's a first world problem. You know, it's all, it's all in your mind and not something that you can just overcome. So I'm going to dive into um, a handful of different types of mental health issues and their characteristics. I'll probably be reading from my notes a lot because there's a lot of different uh, symptoms that come along with these. There's five different ones that I'm going to mention. Um, and when I talk about the symptoms of these diseases, uh, pay attention. They don't just cover things going on in your mind. They're also going to start manifesting themselves physically as well. So first, there is social anxiety disorder, or also known as general anxiety disorder. Some common symptoms are uh, fear of situation when you, which you might be judged, worrying about embarrassing or humiliating yourself, concern that you'll offend somebody, intense fear of interacting or talking with strangers. That makes things like this for me, like, just, uh, horrible. <laughs> Um, fear of physical symptoms that might embarrass you, like blushing, sweating, um, having a shaky voice, how many times I've said um while I'm on the stage. Uh, avoiding situations where you might be a center of attention, like being on stage. Uh, having anxiety and anticipation of a feared activity or event, like somebody invites you to a party you don't want to go to because you know, you're, you're already having anxiety about thinking about going. Uh, spending, this is a big one for me anyways, uh, spending time after a social situation, analyzing your performance and identifying flaws in your interactions. So I can tell you that coming to a new country for the first time has been extremely hard on my anxiety. Um, like for example, I will be walking down the sidewalk and consciously, at, so far I've been here for like three, four days, Every time I'm walking down the sidewalk, I make a concerted effort to make sure I'm on the left-hand side <laughs> because it goes like traffic. Um, but I'm always thinking about that kind of stuff because it's just, you can't shut it off sometimes. Um, and another is like experiencing worst possible consequences when interacting with people. Uh, now, you might say to yourself uh, that these types of things happen every now and then to you maybe, but um, 
the diagnoses specifies that these are intense fears, um, ones that you can't shut off, ones that happen all the time, not just like here and there, maybe once a week, whatever. Um, I know I'm not a doctor, but if you experience any of those symptoms or the ones I'm going to talk about, I suggest you get some help, and I will cover that kind of stuff too. And other things you like avoid coming into a room that's already full, like if somebody were to walk in when I'm halfway, you know, done with a talk, they just like nope out, I just leave because I couldn't handle somebody maybe looking at them because it's awkward, right? Um, eating in front of others is a common one. Um, I had a friend that I used to work with that uh, could not eat in front of people and would take her lunch out to her car or, you know, find a, a conference room and have to go because she didn't want anybody ever have to see her chew. So that's, that's another one that's possible. Um, dating. So first off, I can tell you dating in your 30s in small town in America is a nightmare in its own. Um, and then you tack on anxiety, and it's pretty damn impossible. Um, going to work or school, returning items to a store, uh, making phone calls, that kind of stuff. Uh, I don't know how many relationships I've ruined due to uh, like pan uh, panic and anxiety attacks. I don't mean just like romantic relationships. I mean friendships, anything more than just a business relationship. Um, because I'll, I'll like overinvest myself, or I think I'm not investing enough time, that my jokes are stupid, that my haircut sucks, that whatever, I just overthink everything. And in my head, I just completely push people away even though everything is happening in my mind and I've not actually done any of that. So next up, super fun one is uh, bipolar disorder, uh, also previously known as manic depressive. And there's two sides to this one. First off is the manic part. Uh, some of the symptoms are being up normally upbeat, jumpy, wired, not being able to sleep, increased energy, um, an exaggerated, uh, exaggerated self uh, sense of well-being, um, like super awesome self-confidence, euphoria, that kind of stuff. Um, racing thoughts, distractibility, um, and in, in more extreme cases, you can have poor decision making. So like going on buying sprees, gambling all your money, you know, making um, uh, huge job change decisions without any thought behind it. And the second part um, of bipolar spectrum is all the depressive char uh, the characters of like average depression, um, like marked loss of interest in things that you once liked, um, sleeping all the time, that kind of stuff. <laughs> Um, <laughs> you can also have a uh, feeling of worthlessness, um, excessive or inappropriate guilt. Next is borderline personality disorder. Also, also what I found out was called dissociative identity disorder, which is difficult to say. Um, it's a mental health disorder that impacts the way you think about yourself and others. Um, so it'll cause problems in everyday functioning life. A lot of, uh, it's, it's rare to have this first off, um, and it's especially rare to have uh, really super serious um, cases of it, but you do hear about it a lot. Um, shifts between the different personalities uh, are, all, are often um, accompanied by blackout periods. And, you know, the, the one personality may not know about the other in a lot of, uh, at least in the more extreme cases, they won't. Um, you can have, like, risky um, and impulsive behavior, uh, like reckless driving, unsafe sex, binge eating, drug abuse, that kind of stuff, and then completely swap to, like, you're a nice person, and then you're not doing any of that kind of stuff. So depression is one of the most talked about mental health issues out there. Um, a lot of people will associate it with just being sad about something in particular or, you know, something that just kind of puts you in a down mood, but it's way more than that. Um, according to a recent WHO study, World Health Organization, depression is the leading cause of physical illness in the world, which I thought was interesting. 
Um, you'll have feelings of sadness, tearfulness, emptiness, hopelessness, um, thoughts of suicide, attempted suicide, sleep disturbances, and that just goes on and on and on. This is my favorite one. <laughs> um, and a lot of times anxiety comes along with depression as well. You'll have trouble thinking, concentrating, um, unexplained physical problems like back pain or headaches. Next up is post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, is a mental health condition triggered by a terrifying event. Uh, a lot of people in armed forces have PTSD, especially if they've seen active combat. Um, but also you'll see like, um, uh, like earthquake survivors, rape victims, that kind of stuff that, you know, the particularly traumatizing event uh, can cause you to have PTSD. Um, you'll have recurrent and unwanted distressing memories of those traumatic events. Um, you'll relive the traumatic event like it, like, like flashbacks, you'll have those. Um, severe emotional distress and physical reactions to something that reminded you of the thing that had happened. And then there's obsessive compul compulsive disorder. People, you know, throw that around all the time. You have OCD just because you like things in a spreadsheet. Doesn't really count. Um, <laughs> so it features a pattern of unreasonable thoughts and fears, which are the obsessive, uh, obsessions, that lead you to do repetitive behaviors, which are the compulsions. Um, some really notable cases that I'm sure people, well, at least one person you've heard of before. So Nikola Tesla um, had severe OCD, I guess. Um, he would walk around a building three times before he entered it. He had severe um, fear of circle-shaped objects, which is a little odd. Um, and he wouldn't eat alone with women. Um, there was a case in the 1800s that there was this young lady that would compulsively wash her hands. Um, and I don't mean like twice after you go to the bathroom. Every time she touched something, so like 200 times a day. Um, and, you know, back in the 1800s, things weren't really clean. <laughs> so it was a little, little bit harder back then. Um, she wouldn't touch people in the street, you know, walking, walking down the street or whatever. Uh, so that was a, a pretty serious case. Um, and another one that I read about uh, was the case of Joanna H. Also in the 1800s, she, had, uh, she was obsessed with the idea that she would commit adultery on her new husband. Um, she was happily married, had no desire to have an affair, but sh if you would have told her that she had one, she would instantly believe you, especially with people that she had just met. Um, it just in her head, she thought she had been unfaithful to her husband. Um, it got bad enough that she built her own chastity belt, and the only person with the key was her husband, which I find a little odd, but whatever works. So fear of contamination or dirt, um, we covered needing things orderly and symmetrical. Uh, something else that accompanies it is aggressive or horrific thoughts about uh, harming yourself or others, and a lot of times I'll either have sexual or religious um, uh, undertones. So we can all agree that one of these conditions can royally suck, not to mention if you have more than one. Um, so what do you do if either you or somebody you care about is experiencing one or more of these? Um, how do you cope or how do you help them cope? Um, I had sent out, uh, let's see, at the beginning of the year, this sur you know, completely uh, non-scientific survey on Twitter. Um, it asked about 20 different questions about how people's perceptions and personal ideas are about mental health. One of the questions was, let's see here, do you participate in any activities to reduce, dull, or improve the stress or feelings you're having? such as alcohol, prescription drugs, other drugs, exercise, medication, or other. Uh, first, right off the bat, you know, I, I have a handful of people yell at me because uh, it wasn't multiple answer, <laughs> because a lot of times people do all of those things to try and cope with their stress. Um, and if I would have taken it myself before I sent it out, I would have realized it, because so do I. Uh, so out of 860 responses, uh, some of my favorites, um, in the other category, you know, the little sliver of other, favorite responses on how to deal with stress. 
uh, pretend to be a Vulcan, uh, masturbation, which I should have just listed as a category, cats, and Twitter. Um, all wonderful outlets. Uh, <laughs> so there's a lot of different coping mechanisms that are out there that can help with this stuff, including medicine, not necessarily needed, but it's out there. Um, and here you kind of see the earlier hypothesis at work because of booze and things, right? Um, and when I started this and I first put the survey out, I was talking to a friend of mine that's actually a mental health counselor. Um, and one of the things that he pointed out was the quickest way to improve your brain chemistry is moving around. And he gave me two different, uh, two different things, the two best ways to improve the chemicals in your brain without drugs. Anybody want to shout out the answers? Top two things? Exercise, yep, exercise and sex is the top two things. So as long as you're doing it right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, not to go directly from sex to my mom, that would be a whole Freudian thing, um, but I use her as a sounding board for a lot of my stuff uh, that I talk about. You know, I'll show her my slides and tell her what I'm talking about, even though she has most of the time no idea what I'm going to be talking about. Um, but I like making her laugh and blush and, you know, do anything I can to embarrass her at the same time. So, when I started talking about the different coping mechanisms and what I was doing on, you know, this part of the presentation, um, she talked about her great-grandmother, which would have been my great-great-grandma. Um, I guess she had been institutionalized back then because of her sad and withdrawn behavior during menopause. Um, and for her treatment at the time, she was giving uh, regular shock treatments. And there's nothing like, you know, trying to bring yourself out of clinical depression than just shocking the hell out of you all the time. But now we have better options. Um, people talk sarcastically about safe spaces, and especially when we're making fun of millennials. Um, I think that we can agree the majority of normal people don't need safe spaces, um, but it is nice to have somebody to talk to, to have an outlet, um, whether it be you know a professional or you know the person sitting next to you, you know somebody on a Slack channel, whatever. It's nice to have somebody to talk about these kind of things, um, and you can use that as a coping mechanism as well. Is talking, and it can feel good to externalize those feelings, um, especially when you're not being judged and mocked, you know, because a lot of us have the same problems, so, I mean, other than if you're an asshole, why would you judge and mock the other person? Um, so back then, you couldn't really talk about those things, you know, when they were getting those shock treatments, um, just like you couldn't talk about divorce or teen pregnancy, and yay, I've had all three, so I'm going to, I can talk about all of them now. Um, so not can you, uh, so not only can you talk to people in your field about your thoughts, you know, you can talk to professionals, um, whether it be uh, a psychotherapist, um, uh, you know, people that give you drugs, psychologists, psychiatrists, whatever you want to call them. Um, you know, it's, it's important to have an outlet to, for that kind of stuff and not just keep it all internalized. So getting back to getting all doped up. Um, so the last 20 years, we've seen a 400% increase in the use of antidepressants, uh, with an estimated 1 in 10 adults now taking them. Now, I don't want to devalue people suffering at all, but we also don't want to be too quick uh, to throw pills at a problem, for which, you know, better non-medical solutions may exist, but, you know, again, that's not my job to do, because I just, just studied this stuff a little bit, like, that's not actually what I do. Um, but it's great that people are doing other things, right? They're, like we saw in that, um, that pie chart before, they're meditating, they're exercising, they're hacking, they're teaching, they're doing all this kind of stuff as creative outlets to, um, to help with those stresses. And a good amount of those things also increase your dopamine level without the need of anything clinical. Um, when I was first prescribed Zoloft, so I don't know if you guys have the same named stuff, here, <laughs> um, but uh, this is kind of the explanation that I received from my doctor, that it's just a simple chemical imbalance in your brain, and Zoloft is the answer. It's going to fix that. It's going to, you know, make it so all the chemicals are flowing correctly, and, you know, that's it. Simple answer to simple, simple problem. I wholeheartedly took that as gospel um, because logically on the surface it made sense. You know, it's a physiological problem fixing with meds. 
Uh, and I found out through my research that's not necessarily 100% true. From what I found in those uh, journals and articles and everything, they have absolutely no idea why some of this stuff works. Which, all right, I get that science is hard. Um, the studies uh, that I read also pointed out that issues arise from things like faulty mood regulation by the brain, genetic vulnerabilities, uh, stressful life events, other medications that might be interacting, other medical problems. Um, there was an uh, American Psychological Association article that I'm also gonna quote. So they said, we do not dispute the possibility that neurotransmitters and other brain chemicals play a significant role in the etiology of depression. However, we are concerned that the chemical imbalance explanation may not reflect the full range of causes of depression and may be given greater credence by both consumers and practitioners than is supported by sound research and may be understood in an overly simplistic manner. But really, what part of medical science do we not get in an overly simplistic manner? So I, tarted, I started taking Zoloft about six months before uh, the end of my marriage, and it was amazing. Um, I wasn't sad anymore, I had lots of energy, and I thought it was amazing. It kind of made me a zombie, though. Um, I was pretty much dead inside. I had no emotions, um, which was great to kind of propel me through divorce and a job change twice and a move and another move and all of that lawyer costs and all the shit that I went through in that year. It was amazing to not have to have any emotions. Um, but after I got done with that, I thought that that's probably not the best thing to not feel <laughs> at all. Um, and so that's, you know, there's reasons why I switched. So after all of that had died down, I realized it's time to switch um, because I was trying to uh, fill that hole in my life with other not very healthy things. Um, and it takes a lot of self-reflection to kind of realize you're going down a bad path <laughs> and take steps to change that without somebody like smacking you in the face and telling you you should be doing something else with your life. So I changed to something called uh, Wellbutrin, which is kind of like speed, which is great. <laughs> um, helps me concentrate, <laughs> gives me a shit ton of energy, and fix my anxiety. And then I take Xanax every now and then when I have to be around this many people and I'm freaking out. So now that I covered a whole bunch of my personal baggage uh, and different coping mechanisms um, about how you know uh, we look at how we can treat others now. So as I said before, I've talked to an amazing amount of different people since bringing up this topic and have heard their stories and backlashes and everything else that they've talked to people about. Um, and I wanted to find out what would help other people, right? Help either your loved ones or you deal with a loved one or you know, what to say, what not to say. Um, I got a huge range of responses from people. Um, Personally, now that I can tell when I have an anxiety attack happening, I have a few key people that I can go to to uh, verbalize you know, what's gonna happen that we have had conversations beforehand and they know what they can do to help me. Um, the two most common negative things that I've heard are one, you're overreacting. Um, and I'm, I'm definitely not the only one that happens to for sure. I've heard that one a lot. Um, and this. Um, so I get this a lot, like, you know, you, you have so much going on for you. Why, why are you sad? <laughs> um, you know, I have fantastic job, three wonderful kids, a house, um, everything going for me. How, what gives me the right to be, you know, sad about things or, you know, depressed about anything in life? There's nothing to be depressed about, right? Um, but I've actually caught myself thinking the same thing about others, which I shouldn't because, you know, I, I, see this, I see what happens when people say it to me because there's shit going on in my head that you can't verbalize to them and so on and so forth. But instead, you know, you can tell them that you love them, that they're amazing, and while it's nice to hear, sometimes that doesn't even help. 
and people will tell you try thinking happier thoughts because you know that always works great. Uh, you can't <laughs> you can't will yourself to be happy when there might just be a chemical imbalance happening in your head. Um, you know you can always put on that happy face and go out and about and you know do things, but you know that's not really helping you be healthier. Uh, a good amount of the mental health issues come with their own physical symptoms, like I mentioned before. Um, even if it's difficult for the everyday person to see, uh, even sometimes we can't see it ourselves, you can't just tell somebody to make more of an effort when they physically can't. So let's cover some of the do-says. Uh, first off, sometimes you just have to listen. Listen to them about, you know, communication is hard, right? Um, listening can be even harder. Um, it's just as simple as that, though. A lot of times they just need a you know, shoulder to cry on, somebody to listen, uh, and not judge or mock. Uh, talking about it and knowing what works for each individual person helps as well and definitely can help more than you know. Uh, there's a handful of those people that I can go to, and you know I'll use things like a keyword like porcupine because I love porcupines. Um, it's like a safe word for your mental health. And I find it helps a lot, especially if I can't, I can't talk at the moment that I'm having a panic attack. Uh, maybe I can remember that keyword or at least kind of give an idea of what's happening in my head. Uh, mine specifically happen a lot at conferences because, I mean, honestly, day to day, I sit at home all day. I work from home uh, every day. <laughs> uh, yeah, my kids are there half the time, but, you know, that's not really adult interaction. And I live in the middle of nowhere, don't really have any friends around me, all my friends are on the internet. And then I come to a conference and boom, you're just surrounded by people. Um, that and I used to forget to take my meds and exercise when I was traveling and just fall into a lot of bad behaviors um, when I went to conferences that I've since learned are probably triggers for all the shit that was happening to me during. Uh, but having some semblance of a routine will also help. Uh, another thing you have to understand about interacting with others is they might just not feel like going out. Um, pushing them doesn't really help. <laughs> it just makes them feel worse that they can't go. Um, and I find this to be true, you know, no matter the issue, you know, th maybe they just don't want to be in enclosed spaces with others. The thought of using public restrooms, loud noises, um, you know, whatever it is, being crazy can take a huge toll on your social life. And there's a great article that a friend of mine sent me called This is How You Love Someone with Anxiety. And a lot of the points just hit home big time with both of us and in different ways, really. Um, one other thing that describes me, I think, to a T, uh, sadly enough, I'll go ahead and uh, admit this on stage. Uh, silence kills anyone with anxiety. It creates problems in their mind that aren't even there, and it ends in apologies that aren't even needed. Uh, somebody will send me a text, or I will send a text, and uh, get no response, and freak, freak out. <laughs> like, all of those horrible things that could have possibly happened. I said something to piss them off. Um, whatever, you know, there's a huge list of things that just automatically go into my mind when I haven't been responded to. And I know that that makes absolutely no sense. You know, people have lives. I have a life. I'm not going to be able to respond with people right away, right? And I know that. I, I mean, to my core, I know that's what is happening. But I still freak out. It doesn't matter. Uh, another thing, uh, the phrase is, um, it's OK, or how can I help, are probably two of the most important things that you can say and nothing beats a blanket fort. It's the best. I love the fact that you guys have like bean bags out there. It's fantastic. Uh, and not only have I gotten the positive and negative stories about the interactions around mental health, but almost everyone that I've talked to over the last few years have been super surprised that either I had depression and anxiety or people were surprised that they had it. And in a few cases, um, I was told that they're shamed into thinking it's their fault, which is awesome. 
Uh, not only is it difficult to talk about in the beginning, but so many other things come into play that make you want to bottle it up and try and force it to go away. Uh, I want to show you a couple things that our community is already doing. doing. Uh, one is ironin.com. It's I-R-0-N-I-N.com. If any of you know Jason Street, um, great guy. He set up this website that uh, kind of focuses on um, mental health issues and also starting an infosec. It's a lot of like beginner level, like, all right, I'm a college student, now what? So that's a really good uh, uh, resource that's out there. And the next one, hopefully all this audio works. Um, if anybody knows who Movix is, uh, you might have seen this before. This is about hacking together. And I will try not to cry at the end of this. I seem to always cry at the end of this. Uh, but let's see how this goes. All right, here goes. <laughs> Hi, my name's Rob Fuller, and I'm a hacker. Now, every single one of you watching probably has a different definition of what that might be. But I guarantee not a single one of those definitions includes race, creed, color, religion, sexual preference, or anything in between. The hacker community is filled with human beings, people from all walks of life. In our community, like any social community, there are people among us, friends, acquaintances, con buddies that have problems that many of you might not even know they have. We have lost too many of those friends to suicide, drugs, alcohol, depression, and crime. Many of us dove into the world of computers and the internet because it was a place of acceptance. But there's a dark side to this world. It is too easy to disconnect, to miss those markers when all you see is what someone tweets or IMs. We can't see when you hurt, when you cry. There are many ways to help us that need it and are afraid to ask because one of the biggest biases we still have in our community is showing weakness. But you can let those around you know you care, that you are there for them, and the door is open to talk anytime. But one of the best ways is just to be around each other. Hang out, go to a movie, have a good time, talk about your day. To be a true friend, not just another face in a lobby of a conference. If you wish to join me in this fight, please make a video or just tell your friends, your con buddies, or your acquaintances that you just see at that lobby con that we are all hacking together. <laughs> all right, so there's that, and thank you for the tissues, just in case. Um, so let's do some hacking together. My door, my phone, my DMs, everything is always open. Uh, to talk about anything that's on your mind. I know there's an Info Sanity Slack channel out there as well, a handful of people that like to talk about this kind of stuff. Um, a lot of times when I'm feeling lonely or disconnected, I'll like tweet out a Google chat, a Google video, you know, hangout thing, and you know, so I can see people face to face, since I can't like just jump on a jet and go see them. Um, and I think the saddest part of the survey results were <laughs> Uh, were the answers to the question, have you ever felt like you weren't worth much as a person? Uh, over 50% of people answered yes. And that like breaks my heart big time. Um, I feel like having more of an open dialogue about this uh, and killing it as a taboo thing to talk about is gonna help you know, tons in fixing it going forward. So let's just be more compassionate to each other and work together and with each other even if you don't like each other, a life is just a life, uh, you know, a life is a life. Um, and just like Rob said, we've already lost too many people in our community due to that kind of stuff. Here's some amazing worldwide uh, and nationwide organizations. I'm sure you guys have some here as well that you can actually talk to people online. You can call them, whatever. Um, if you feel like there are no other options and you can't, you know, physically talk to the person next to you. And I wanted to finish up a picture of a cute puppy because I know this is a huge downer of a talk. <laughs> um, so three things to remember that I hope you walk away from this with. Uh, you're definitely not alone if you're struggling. Two, get help if you need it. And three, be compassionate to others. And thank you so much for listening.